All right, I'm very conscious of the fact that you've been sitting and listening, and we've still got to do a bit more, but I promise the majority of it will be, will be practical after that. So um, we won't be sitting after lunch. We will all afternoon, we'll try and make stuff a bit practical. Um, so uh, but we just need to get on just to labour, just because it's helping us understand where we can have an effect. Um, so engagement happens toward the end of pregnancy, and we talk about fifths of engagement. Uh, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths engagement, which is dividing the head into fifths and how much of it is palpable above the suprapubic um, uh, upper part of the, of the pubis. And so um, uh, midwives often write two fifths or three fifths engaged. And with a um, uh, first pregnancy, once engagement happens, it's very unlikely for that to change. Uh, the baby will remain engaged, sorry, the baby will remain engaged for the uh, rest of the um, uh, pregnancy. Whereas um, subsequent pregnancies, because everything's stretched before, there is still more room for the head, so the baby can engage, come back out and unengage again, uh, and, and may not engage until labour actually occurs. So engagement can happen anywhere from about 36 weeks onwards um, in, uh, in, a, in a, a, a pre. Um, so uh, if we're looking here, um, yeah, so the head will generally, it will, it will, ideally we want the spine to sit on the left side of the abdomen, and so the head will then engage, uh, the posterior part of the occiput will engage on that left anterior side. Um, you know once the head is engaged, because you can palpate the head and you'll feel that the head doesn't move very much, it's, it's not really palpable, uh, it's not really mobile <coughs> anymore. Um, okay. So, labour begins then with either a rupture of membranes, not necessarily, that can come much later. And in fact, it's possible to deliver a baby without the membranes rupturing, but that's quite rare. Um, certainly that tends to speed things up, but rupture of membranes can be the beginning, um, the beginning of contractions. There can be the loss of the mucous blood, which leads to a bit of bleeding, um, which is uh, a show, sometimes referred to as a show. Um, so a woman says, I've had a show, this means that mucus plug which plugs the cervix has come loose. And uh, that's sometimes what a midwife will try to dislodge doing a sweep, uh, which is if a woman's over, uh, running over on her labour and a, a, a midwife will do an examination where she will do a sweep of the membranes or a sweep of the cervix, and she tries to dislodge the plug, and that is in theory to try to stimulate um, labour. Um, there can be an increase in bowel movement as well, because obviously the bowel is going to change um, as part of the beginning of labour. Okay, so you can see here the cervix initially effaces before it dilates. So you can see initially that the cervix is quite thick here. Uh, whoops, it's this side, isn't it? I can say. Okay, so we have this thickening here, and the effacement is as the head pushes down, so no dilation occurs, you just get a thinning of the cervix. And this is an effaced cervix here, and with some, some dilation. So that's why the first part can take a while, because you're waiting for effacement to occur uh, before you actually then start to get dilation of the cervix. Okay? Um, so uh, we can see, again, how that effacement um, uh, progresses, and then dilation. Uh, and we talk about zero at the beginning, and 10 centimetres is considered fully dilated, and um, that's when the sort of second stage of labour begins. So, uh, here we can see engagement where the head is slightly descended and it begins to flex, and by flex we just mean chin tucks in, so we present the smallest diameter possible to the pelvic bowl. Uh, and this is the angle at which it comes in on this left oblique axis, um, not to be confused with the left oblique axis and the sacrum. Uh, okay, so then um, we get this transition where the baby goes from uh, being lateral to an AP position. So this is the rotation I was talking about. And you can imagine at this stage, the shoulders are still and the head are in slightly different orientation. So there's quite a twist taking place on the cervical spine during this process. So the head literally comes in um, on, a, uh, on an oblique or lateral 
Often once it's lower down, it'll actually be fully lateral, and then it will rotate, and the head will rotate, but the body remains uh, in that rotated position. So the head then goes AP, and then the head delivers around the pubis, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, of the stages. So this is the rotation. The head is rotating as it comes down through the pelvis. So it goes from lateral, occiput lateral, to occiput anterior. Okay? And babies are nearly always delivered with the occiput anterior, eventually. So even if they come down occiput posterior to start with, they have to make a long turn all the way around so that the occiput comes uh, around on the pubis, because it's very difficult to deliver with the chin anterior around the pubis. It's possible, but it's very, very, very rare. Uh, so the head is born... Uh, where there's this strong extension as the head comes around the uh, pubis. So you imagine you know, the kind of stresses that's placing on the baby, on uh, the baby's occiput. Um, so yes, the order of appearance, occiput, vertex, frontal, face, chin. So that's in theory the order in which things present. This is the ideal. And then you get this period of restitution. So the head is delivered, AP, but then once the head is free, it's then able to then come back in line with its shoulders. It's kind of like, oh, thank goodness for that. So again, you can imagine this rotationary strain which is taking place on the baby's neck during this process. And this is normal physiology. Yeah, so it's quite stressful. And yet the body adapts pretty well, but it's why we need to be checking baby's cervical spines as well as their craniums for you know, rotation preferences and so on. Um, and why we want the pelvic floor to be allowed for this to be able to happen. Okay, so then we see the shoulders. Um, uh, as they're delivered, and again, you can see uh, it's not doesn't always require assistance from the midwife to do this, um, but uh, you see the deliver the anterior shoulder and the posterior shoulder, um, uh, and again you can see this axis, and this is quite interesting in the sense that because we're bipedal, uh, we we the pubis forms a kink. You know there isn't a straight route. You have to come around, uh, you know, so, and, and that's what makes labour so much tougher for bipeds compared to quadrupeds. Because you see in quadrupeds, their sacrum is straight uh, and the pubis is much bigger and there isn't this curve. The, 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 the fetus will be delivered on a horizontal axis, whereas actually in babies you've got this enormous, in, in humans, bipeds, you've got this enormous um, uh, 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 route it's got to turn around, which slows the whole thing up and it's much more stressful. Uh, mum baby, uh, mum baby. That's, that's the price we pay for being bipeds. Uh, because obviously, you know, as bipeds, we want to hold everything in, ideally. And uh, so if everything wasn't on this axis, then forces would, you know, every time we coughed or sneezed, everything would kind of just fall out. Yes. Is that why there's now a trend for delivering on all fours? Uh, possibly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, any, I mean, I think a woman should just be allowed to be in whatever position. I mean, it's, it's, so you look at the work of people like, um, um, oh, French, uh, he pioneered water births. I don't I've met know him. Mean, I can't oh, I've met him so many times. Michel Odon? Michel Odon, yeah, that's it, Michel Odon. I can complete brain fade there for a minute. Michel Odon, who is a French obstetrician, and he was the one who pioneered water births uh, and uh, natural births. And he, he basically believes you should just allow a woman just to labour, have no interference, probably not have the partner there. Just have an older, experienced midwife sitting in the corner knitting. He doesn't mean that in a sexist way. He said it's a very repetitive, boring activity that creates calm in the midwife, that then creates calm in the mother. The room should be dark or not, you know, not brightly lit. The woman should just be left to be alone so that, because birth is a subcortical activity. I, it shouldn't be something you're thinking about. Okay, if you want to get the best, um, and I don't mean to be in any way rude, but it makes the point, um, you know, during, uh, during sex, point of orgasm, you wouldn't want to be saying, oh, what should we have for supper tonight? It's kind of a bit of a, you know, you don't want to talk at that point. It's everything subcortical at that moment. Birth should be much the same process. And yet we ask women, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I get consent for this? Can I get consent for that? We put them in a brightly lit room. We make them lie on their back. We make them not be able to adopt a position that's more physiological adaptable. And we wonder why labour goes wrong because we're not actually supporting physiology. Now, midwives get this. 
You know, midwives don't want interference. Well, certainly the old-fashioned midwives, you know, would deliver anything. And this is Michel Adam was of the view: you can deliver breach, you can deliver anything. You just, you just let nature will take it over. And he's really against things like optimal fetal positioning, which is teaching because he said you create anxiety in the mother, and you create this sense that she is not in control, that it's not her body, and 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 she loses autonomy. Uh, and makes her feel as though she's somehow a victim of circumstance, rather than the fact that her body is more than capable. Nature has been doing this for millions of years, and we haven't suddenly forgotten how to have babies. Now, he's of the view that you create this environment where it is safe, and then, of course, you intervene when necessary, when it goes wrong. Of course, you do cesarean sections, or you do fontus or forceps when necessary, because clearly, before we had all of those interventions, women died in childbirth, a lot of them babies died of infection and all that. So it's not that we forget all of that, but we keep it in reserve and we allow physiology to take place where possible. And, then, and it's, it's a supportive thing. So anyway, that, I sort of gone off on a bit of a, a thing. But it's quite important that we, we understand that's the physiology. And, and the reason why it goes wrong in hospitals so often is because, you know, midwife is changing partway through, is changing shifts. There's lots of examinations which are done and there's a lot of ass covering by the professionals because they don't you know obviously quite understand you know often the midwife doesn't know the mother so she doesn't want to be left to blame if a baby dies so they're wanting to put the monitor on and keep all of that but it, it interferes with the process uh, of, of the natural physiology of mm. delivery you know if you want if you look at uh, apparently if you get a dog or a cat in labor and you shine it they'll go and find somewhere dark uh, you shine a torch on them while they're in labour, and labour stops. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, very powerful. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, it's, so, so it's important we allow this process as much as we can um, to happen. Anyway, so first stage, transitional stage, and then crowning. So, you know, again, we've got these sort of timings for these. Uh, you know, it can, certainly for a first child, it can be one hour per centimeter of dilation, so 10 hours, and so that's including effacements as well. And then this is the second stage where everyone wants to push, and ideally, um, art for a second child, it should only take 30 minutes or less, um, and it may take one to two hours for a first child. That's where everything's ideal. Obviously, if it goes, starts to go longer than that, there's a lot of compression on the baby and a lot of potential trauma to the mother. And you can see, again, as the baby's coming down, if the baby gets stuck anywhere, if it needs instrumental delivery, you can see the forces that are being placed on the bladder, on the rectum. It's no wonder that, that we get rectal seals and uh, uh, um, where the bladder prolapses as well. I forgot the name for that. I'm real brainy until it's Saturday. But, you know, we know the biggest single risk for prolapse in women is vaginal delivery. You know, that's just a fact. And the more vaginal deliveries you have, the more likely you are to have um, prolapse later in life. Um, but it will tend to come later in life because that's when the estrogen levels drop and estrogen keeps tone in the pelvic floor muscles and once you lose that estrogen then there can be a loss and then any damage which has been done years before then uh, uh, will, will all kick in at that point, yes. Is there anything you can do to prevent that? Or to yes, that? yes, there is. You make sure you have a nice healthy pelvic floor beforehand, so perineal massage which you can teach to women, uh, certainly from 32 weeks onwards, you can teach them to do basic perineal massage. So, how would you instruct a woman to do perineal massage? You're all osteopaths. I think you told us two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. So, put the foot on the on the bathtub. Yes. And uh, use the thumb. Yes. Along the line of the adductor, I think. Yeah, posterior. So, posterior vaginal wall. And they want to push, push backwards, they push posteriorly and they will do this stretching. If you do this regularly, the perineum will start to adapt, and there is good evidence to suggest that that can reduce tearing. And obviously, if you've then got reduction in tearing, there's less pressure, you're gonna have less strain, and less pressure being put on bladder and rectum. Obviously, there's some genetic predispositions. If you're a woman who is hypermobile, um, so if you're a woman who can bring your thumb <laughs> to your uh, forearm here, and you do that before you deliver, the chances are you know, you're gonna be at greater risk of prolapsation because that's how your ligaments are structured. But you can still you know, counteract that by good pelvic floor health and, um, and just keeping mobile and good osteopathic care during, during pregnancy. Okay, so um, yeah, so we've got this extension and then restitution. Extension here, where the head pivots around the um, uh, 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 pubis, and then we get this restitution or rotation where the head comes back in line with the shoulders. 
So, uh, yeah, I'll include these, just we're not going to go through those. We've got dural girdles and, you know, uh, uh, how that adapts to the pelvic floor. So obviously the baby's head allows this process to take place and we know that it's good for babies and it clears the lungs of fluid and it kicks in with the CNS with all of the compression and then sudden release and the first breath and all of those things that take place, which, uh, you know, birth definitely benefits. So although it's tough for baby, it is useful. It's physiologically beneficial as it is for mum as well. Her recovery is going to be better. So this just shows you the different uh, presentations. LOA, which is left occiput anterior, which is the most common, followed by LOP, ROP and ROA. So those are the different um, uh, uh, direction, uh, the different presentations. But if they come on this right occiput posterior, the occiput still travels 272 degrees round. So there's a long period of rotation for the occiput to come posterior to the pubis. So that's why back to back delivery, where it's either LOP or ROP, that the, 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 it takes so much longer, the labor, because you've got all this time of rotation. So that's tough on baby and it's tough on mum. It's very painful for mum as well. So you've got these different presentations, breech, shoulder, face, uh, posterior and brow presentations. Um, so yeah, all of those are non-ideal. We haven't got time to go into each of those, but I think there are pictures in here. Induction will always equal more force on the child. So we like to avoid induction if we can as osteopaths um, because uh, yeah, it's not great either for baby or for mum. You know, it's, it's okay, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, you still want a baby that's healthy and mum's okay and alive and all of that. So we've got to sometimes intervene this way, but if we can avoid it, that's got to be a good thing. So we've got different kinds of breach, which is complete or incomplete, um, which we don't deliver vaginally in this country anymore. So midwives don't have to do it anymore, they're not trained to, because it's always done with cesarean, because it's considered to be lower risk. And that's probably true. I mean, they did the long-term long longitudinal studies and looked at the outcomes, and they are definitely better that you just do an elective cesarean rather than um, allow these babies to deliver. Because you imagine you can deliver the, the pelvis and the rest of the body and suddenly find the head can't deliver, you know, and there's a lot of strain and so on, and nerve damage which can be done that way. So um, most of the time it's okay, but you know, we just don't do it anymore. Um, von twos and forceps, again you've got to bear in mind that these are being applied already at a point of maximum compression and then you're applying more pressure on the baby at this stage. Um, and obviously in these cases also in order to get access to the baby's head you've got to, you've got to cut the pelvic floor with an episiotomy which um, uh, in this country we do on a left oblique line, um, yeah so sorry yes if you're looking at it's patient's right so right handed uh, a midwife, they will cut, so it'll go to the right side, a right oblique line. Um, and uh, we know there's more pain associated with the episiotomy versus second degree tears, um, and the uh, disability lasts longer and so on, even though the scar is neater. Um, so we like to avoid that if possible. Um, yeah, we don't need to talk about these. These have just been included in your pack, and back to back. Just means a longer labour and atypical compression on the baby as well. So it can be tough for them. Lots of diaphragm strain on OP babies. Uh, yeah, we won't take those, because that's not part of today. You can just see the pictures, but yeah, you wouldn't want to be delivering like that, would you? <laughs> Imagine the anterior throat. <coughs> tough for everyone. So, uh, and then we've got the normal, uh, 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 just, this is just for information, gas and air, TENS, pethidin, and epidural. Pethidin uh, can suppress the baby's breathing, so um, often epidural is considered preferable. Um, uh, there is, I don't know, there are different views on what epidurals can do uh, in terms of long-term pain afterwards. My view on epidurals is that the issue I have with them is that generally, unless you get mobile ones when we can't move, and so Normally, when you've been lying on your back for a while, you kind of go, oh, I'm getting a bit uncomfortable, and you'll move naturally. You lose all of that with an epidural, so that's why I think there's more issues with an epidural afterwards. You can't feel when to push, you don't feel your pelvic floor, so it's difficult to make an efficient contraction. So there's more likely to be strain on soft tissues as a result. My own view, and I, I don't, you know, it, it, it may be less of an impact on the CNS because of where the needle's going in. In theory, it shouldn't, but obviously, not always done as skillfully potentially or there can be more irritation a lot of women worry about that but I'm more worried about the effect it can have on the soft tissues and the pelvis and the fact that you're putting all the strain while lying supine uh, okay 
and I'll just put in the Apgar thing, just so you can see. And third stage is delivery of the placenta. So from when the baby is delivered, beginning of third stage, and uh, then um, it should take about 30 minutes for delivery there. Um, so cesarean section, electives are given for when there's high risk for the mother or child, uh, or there's an impossibility of a normal birth. Um, uh, yeah, all kinds of reasons, all reasons that you know, and then there's emergency, and emergency section is just done when labour has already started and it's become clear the baby's in distress. Uh, okay, so that is a whistle-stop tour of, of uh, labour and um, uh, deliberate, um, pregnancy and labour. And I've done that because I just want to, so we've got these themes that where uh, there are key structures we need to look at. We're going to spend the rest of the day kind of looking at how we can intervene and how we can begin to assess uh, what is wrong with the patient, or not even necessarily what is wrong, but where they're maybe struggling to adapt to these rapid changes which are taking place in posture and help patients um, feel more comfortable. So, um, uh, what we're going to start with is. Yeah, all right, let's talk about these ideas first of all. Um, so before we do the actual examination, I want to remind us about you know, the models we have within osteopathy and perhaps which ones are most relevant for women's health and for, um, uh, for, for, lay, uh, for, for, for pregnant patients. So if we think about the biomechanical, definitely we need to think about that in pregnancy for sure, the biomechanical model. But the respiratory circulatory model is also really important because women experience an increase in circulatory uh, volume and they experience a compromise in their tidal capacity because the main driver, one of the main drivers being a diaphragm, is compromised in its function. So women are always fighting this hypervolemia, even, even in good health, their circulation is always going to be slightly, they're fighting against that, it's, it's a compromise for them. Um, so we really need to be thinking about that a lot. And in a neurological model, um, for sure, we're looking at reflex activity um, linked to the uterus and, and spinal innervation and so on. And I'm sure we think about metabolic you know, uh, uh, energy and behavioural, for sure, in terms of we, we really have the role of being a real cheerleader for our, for our um, patients and advocating for them and giving them confidence. And we really should try to be as positive as possible um, uh, because... Uh, you know, they're, they're already being told about all the risks by everybody else, and they're already scared and they're googling all the things and worrying about things and we can just be there to say, look, this is normal and, 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 and uh, be research when we, uh, when we uh, talk to our pregnant patients and it's not just a biomechanical, which sometimes I know with the things I emphasise can make it sound as though that's, that's what I'm most interested in and I'm not necessarily. Um, I just want to talk about briefly as well how we think about um, osteopathic models of care and perhaps a pregnant patient. Um, so, uh, and just talk about these, all osteopathy will fall under one of these three uh, models. The symptom-based approach, the minimalist approach, and maximalist approach. So symptom-based, someone comes in with acute low back pain, and it could be in pregnancy, they come in with acute low back pain, and we're going to focus on that initially because maybe they can hardly walk and they're really struggling, we want to be able to get that to improve first of all. But we know in our heart of hearts as osteopaths, that's not the end of the story, that's just the beginning. We then want to think about how we can support them to improve physiologically and stop this sort of thing from happening. So symptom-based is what we do with an acute presentation, often a very clear uh, stage of onset. Um, and usually it's a relatively simple problem in the sense it's clear mechanism and we can see why it's happened. Uh, and, and there's a sort of been a final thing. But all of us know ultimately it's happened because there's a failure to adapt, possibly because there's chronic underlying issues with that. But then you'll also get other patients, and this is where it's really true in, in, in some pregnant patients who are not well. They come to us in later stage of pregnancy. You know, they've gained a lot of weight. They're very immobile. Their breathing mechanics are poor. They've got lots of edema in their ankles. They're very immobile. They're struggling to walk. And, you know, we see a lot of patients like that. And you just think, oh, what am I going to do to support this patient? How am I going to help them? Because uh, you just think, well, there's not one symptom. They're just a bit knackered, you know. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest form, but they are. You just think, well, how am I going to help them? And that's where, with the maximalist approach, you're not doing a huge amount of assessment. Although I'm going to do a lot of assessment today, um, actually sometimes with these patients, it's sort of a bit of a waste of time because 
you're not going to really, they're not going to hold the corrections you make because there isn't available energy to do that. You just want to support their basic mechanics. So you might just work on, with these patients, sideline lots of oscillation to improve breathing mechanics and try and begin to help with edema control and just, just really basic physiological support to start with and then putting in uh, routines about uh, you know, how they sleep, trying to get them to walk a bit more, a bit more exercise, eating well, uh, drinking plenty of fluid, all that kind of thing, just to support basic physiology. So that's the maximalist approach. These are your complex patients where you think, I don't know where to start. You know, it's just really difficult. You just think, I haven't got a clue. There's so many things wrong. They've got a list as long as your arm. Oh, I've got carpal tunnel syndrome. I've got swollen ankles. My pelvis hurts. I've got pain in my tummy. I've got heartburn. I'm really short of breath. I'm getting headaches. And, you know, uh, you know it's all of that. And you just think, you know, how am I going to deal with all of this? I haven't got a clue what to do. And you know, you go to your clinic, you're like, oh my gosh, well, what's the most important thing? You're going to treat it. You know, you don't get that in maternity clinic. You won't have that. Won't happen. But I know in other parts of the clinic. Well, which one of those complaints are you going to focus on? Yeah, well, I want it because <laughs> it's all driven by underlying poor, poor, uh, poor, poor physiology. So these patients are, are where you do lots of treatment. Uh, of physiological support and very little assessment. You're just trying to just help improve the overall picture. And then the minimalist approach is where patients are pretty healthy. These are these ones who come in and they're fit and they're healthy and they have this glow about them, everything moves. And they say, yeah, but I've just got a little bit of something here and I've got a little bit of something here. Can you just all give me a bit of a tune up? And they're a joy to treat because their tissues respond. They get up and they go, oh my gosh, I feel so amazing. You're a real god. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. And your ego feels great. They go out. But it's because they're already in great health. And so they respond. And so all you have to do is just a couple of little you know, targeted adjustments. And they think, fantastic, I feel on top of the world because they're already healthy. And so that's the minimalist approach where you do lots of assessment and then a few very targeted techniques and they hold this correction and they stand beautifully and then they have the perfect labor, it's all done in two hours and they have no tearing, everything's fine. And they put it down to you and it's great. <laughs> so uh, those are the minimalists where very little treatment but quite a lot of assessment and they will hold it. But they need to be healthy to do that. So those are the three different approaches that we have. So we can often have this acute, symptomatic, we have these maximalist, which are kind of unwell, complex, stressed, difficult cases, and then you've got the ones who are just a joy to treat, and if you just do something vaguely resembling osteopathy, uh, they will get better. I think you're amazing. So, uh, but we all aim to try and get people toward the minimalist approach, that's my preference, because it's, it's lots of assessment, and then just fine tuning, and then the physiology just takes over, because they're just ready to run with it, and it's really nice. So, I think with pregnant patients, if you just focus on the diaphragms, all of them, and nothing else, then you'll get good results, because you're really focusing on the circulation model. These diaphragms are where you will get blocks in circulation. So, uh, cervical thoracic, uh, uh, abdominal thoracic, and then the pelvic diaphragm, if you look at each of those, and obviously you've got a cranial diaphragm, if you, look at just, if you looked at just those and got them functioning well, you're going to get optimal results in most of your patients. And this is including your complex maximalist patients. Uh, and it's just a thing coming up with ways in which we can assess. So, so that's, that's the sort of thinking process that I want you to start to have, and, and what I've got in mind with this is This is not exhaustive, this is really just, I mean, I've literally just inserted it just now, so I realise I haven't put in an examination routine. Um, I might, I think there's a video I did with Claire, which I was looking at this morning, I was like, oh, I forgot about this, it's just living on my iPad, when <laughs> Claire was model, <laughs> and I've got it, I don't mind sharing that, I know it's on the ESO one. It's on the VLE, but... Yeah, but I've got it, I've still got a copy of mine, which, you know, it's made on my phone, so, originally, and I donated it to the ESO, so, uh, for that, they, they got use of it, but I feel like it's, uh, it's up to, oh, I don't know what the rights are, but if we, if we kept it just within Kiso rather than on... YouTube or whatever, that would, that would be fine, we can, we can go through that. But that's essentially what I'm going to run through now, elements of it. So, um, yeah, so I think, are there any questions? I know I've sort of bombarded you with lots of, of, of sort of information at this stage, but now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. Start the examination. Okay, so the examination is going to be a screen, first of all, 
which is what this is, a general screen. So screening is just an idea of do I need to get more specific? Do I need to, can I forget this area or do I need to move on? Uh, 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 and so, so screen first of all, which then becomes to more specific looking for somatic dysfunction. So the screen will give you a general indication as to whether there's a problem and then, some, and then you get down to very specific nitty gritty uh, each region, you know, is there a somatic dysfunction there and what do I need to do to correct that? Okay, so that's the objective. So the screen is not to come up with an osteopathic diagnosis to start with. The screen is simply to tell you, do I need to look at this area more closely? Um, uh, and, and that will give you a guide. And then from there, you then get down to the more specific. So we'll start with the screening, and then we'll, then we'll talk about how we evaluate each area um, specifically, just to get an idea of what's wrong specifically. So we'll start with the screen. Is that okay? So that's, that's sort of the view. And obviously this is after you've done all of your medical screening. You know, this is not before. So you've done your medical screening, you've asked all your questions, you've done your differential diagnosis, and you've decided it's safe to treat. Once you've got to that stage, then you step in. This is where the osteopathic examination comes in. Okay, so that's the context for it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep, where it's placed. <laughs> so we're going to start, um, I'm just going to tap hey, shoulders, head, neck, and back, and just get an idea. Tell me if you're going to do this. We're going all right. Yeah. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is just place my hands over the trapezius region and I'm just going to assess. And you can see I'm just very gently, nothing complicated here, just really just assessing is it tight one side or the other. So we can turn around that way. So I'm just palpating and resting over the first rib. And I want to just get an idea is one side higher than the other? Is there a density or hardness in the tissues? Immediately I'm pressing like that. I'm I'm getting a response from the tissues. I can feel whether they push back against me. So as I'm pushing down, I can sense there's more tension on, the, on your left compared to your right. It may not be the painful side, of course. We don't follow pain, we follow tissue density and hardness. Okay, just turn around here. So we just do this properly and we just get a sense of where, okay. So nothing too bad, actually. In her case, she's okay. First ribs are pretty even, both sides. And I can just feel this, uh, fascia here. Now why am I starting here? Why am I interested? And I'm palpating also in the um, supraclavicular space. I'm running along the clavicle and just, just getting a sense of uh, tension there. Why am I interested? Yes, yes. So this is our terminal lymphatic point. So if we have compromising function here, we automatically know there is going to be lymphatic compromise elsewhere in the body systemically. So that's our terminal point. So we can say, first of all, she's fine, actually. It's actually not too bad, but we'd expect that. She's young and healthy and all looks good. We really wish we were the same. So. <laughs> <laughs> so then the next thing is I then just take a contact and just do a very quick palpation of the articular pillars. So I'm just feeling here, are any of those swollen or hard? And we can see she has a bit of uh, tension on the left-hand side here. So all that tells me, I can just gently take that into flexion, I can take it a little bit into extension, just get a sense of, yeah, she really doesn't like that very much mm. at all. So as I take her into flexion and side bend her to the left, there's lots of discomfort. If I take it to the right, it's a bit easier, but if I take her into extension, it's happier, it's more happy. So she has a, already, we know she has, remember, we, oh, well, I'll talk about ERS and FRS later. So I already know she has a little dysfunction in the upper cervical, which I need to look at. So that tells me already now, I need to evaluate her cervical spine. That's enough for me to know. So all I'm doing is just palpating the articular pillars. And I just feel swelling and hardness on the left-hand side, so I know there's dysfunction there. I don't know how important it is yet, but I just know that it's there. And what I get a sense of is how hard is that? How much resistance is that? And I'm going to compare that then. I'm just gonna go through the thoracic spine, and I think, ooh, okay, yeah. So now as I just palpate, and I can do, I can, because I'm wearing gloves, I can't run my fingers down, I don't really, so I'm having to just do a slightly different test here. So you see I apply pressure, and then release, pressure, then release. There's no big rotation, I'm just feeling for hardness, and I'm feeling lateral to the SPs, so I'm just going on to the transverse processes. And as I go down, I can very quickly feel that she has tension here on the right-hand side. So she has a right rotation there, so because that, if I turn it around that way, sorry. So as I push here, she is posterior on the right, the transverse process is posterior on the right-hand side. So automatically we know there's a rotationary restriction, it's asymmetric. So that's already, and I can feel this muscular tension over the top. So it's very easy to get caught up and say, oh, that's rhomboids or erector spiny, but why are they tight? Because there's joint dysfunction underneath it. You could spend all your time doing soft tissue and it'll come back. 
because you haven't corrected the dysfunction. That's honestly probably the single biggest bugbear I have, <laughs> is that we have these indirect and direct tools to deal with the somatic dysfunction, and yet, and this is particularly true of people who've been massage therapists before they're osteopaths, and we see it in students, not so much in practitioners, because you, you kind of got to get the results in the end, but you can do a lot of soft tissue work, and you go into doing soft tissue work, and you think, oh yeah, I've got it better, and then it come back, and it hasn't hasn't gone away, it's come back the following week because you didn't actually correct the underlying restriction, it's just come straight back again because you've got to correct the, the underlying somatic dysfunction. It doesn't mean you've got to crack it, it doesn't, I don't mean that, you've just got to find a way of correcting that dysfunction so that it's no longer dysfunctional. So we'll talk about how we can get into the specifics of that, but I know now I need to assess a thoracic spine. That's enough, so we're over here and here, there are two points of marked tension. And then we come down into her lumbar spine, I'm doing exactly the same exercise, and I can feel it's not particularly bad, but there's a little bit of discomfort, but nothing too bad through there. Now, the next way I can give it another clue is to palpate the spinous processes and just go down, and I just palpate, and I'm really feeling, are any of those harder than the others? And we come to here, and that's probably yours bruised there, as I press on there. Yeah, it's quite sore. A little bit. Not terrible, but it's, it's a bit sore. And there. No? That's okay, actually. Yeah, it's really hard though, really hard. And you can see where that is, that's that thoracal lumbar region, which all of us have, uh, have, uh, are seeing a lot of at the moment. Lumbar spine feels okay as we do that. So that's a very quick spinal check. So if I just do that in real time, palpate here, just very quickly palpate, going down through the spine, and we just run down. That's it. You know, that's what it would look like in real life. Okay? So then I would then just do a quick cavity pressure uh, check. So I apply. AP contact over frontal and occiput, and I compress, and then I can do a little torsional test. Don't follow or anything at this stage, you're just looking to see does the head absorb that compression as I do that? It's not too bad, is it? It's not too uncomfortable. But as I press on her, I can feel the occiput is harder than the frontal. There's definitely a hardness there. I don't have to be able to do cranial to assess that, I can just feel the tissues push back against me. And then I can test the SBS. And we can see here her tissues accept uh, left torsion, but they don't accept a right torsion. That way they're really blocked, but that way. So she has a left torsion. So I can test, I can do that, and I can do that. So it's a mobility test. So as I, as I do that, her tissues accept it really comfortably. As I go in the opposite direction, they block immediately. So obviously you can feel that if you're proficient with uh, feeling a CRI, you can feel into that. But this is, for those who struggle with that, and I honestly really find it hard to feel the CRI. I do lots of cranial work, but I do it in a more articular way. Uh, and, 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 and it's still very much in sympathy with the tissues. You're not trying to drive it, but you're just, just, you're just looking for tissue preference. So it's probably more membranous uh, and articular rather than feeling um, CRI. So it's a, it's a slightly different approach. And I suspect looking at some of the American osteopaths, it's maybe more like how they, how they do the cranial compared to, say, the European model of cranial. Um, but that's how I feel things. I know for some that will seem a little bit heavy-handed, but honestly, it is all right. It's not, it's not, it's not dreadful. But it very, and it's done very quickly. So I can feel she has an SBS restriction, and it's actually quite marked. It's quite strong. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's connected with her upper cervical restriction there. I don't know. Um, then I do a thorax compression. Upper, lower thorax. And we're just looking to see how well does her thorax accept that compression. Is it hard or does it push back against me? And in the pregnant patient, early pregnancy, you can apply a very light palpation and tension. So you can just go epigastric over the umbilicus and lower abdomen. Um, and it's a very, very light pressure. And you're just looking to see how the tissues push back against you. Once the patient is very pregnant, then you're not gonna apply a compression, but you can at least have a contact over the umbilicus and then one over the thoracolumbar and then you can just mobility test, just by testing tissue preference, forward, back, side to side, and just get a sense of where the tension is. Does it accept that movement or does it resist against you? And that's all you need to know, is there resistance? Um, because if there's resistance, then you need to look at it more closely. Okay, so that's all the screening is trying to do. So again, if we do that really quickly, here, here, just palpate down. And 
that's it. That's your standing exam so far. Okay? And then I would ask the patient just to bend forwards. Uh, look for the rising thumb to see if there is one, see if it's even. Okay, and then come back up. And then I always do the gossip test. Bend your right knee and come back up and left knee. And the reason I'm doing that, as much as I'm doing it for lumbar function and SI function, because I can palpate just with my thumbs medial to the PSIS, I can just see if there's hardness in the SIs as you drop. But you're also testing the hip. Because if you turn this way, if you bend your left knee, so as she bends her left knee, her whole pelvis has to move around the right hip. So if, that, if she can't drop, there's going to be issues potentially with that right hip. It could be in quadratus here, not letting it go. So there's somewhere there's going to be dysfunction. So it's very useful just to get a sense of what's going on and how well she's accepting that movement and then come back up. And you're getting a sense of fluidity in the knees and ankles as well. Okay, so that's really my standing exam. And I know it's really basic, but I'd really like you all to practice that and get used to just feeling these areas of density. Those that you're really experienced, okay, that's fine, you can sit down. So I'll, just, I'll speak for one more minute and then you work. We don't teach this for some reason at undergraduate, I'm not quite sure why, but if you watch experienced osteopaths, none of them do, or very few of them do, full mobility testing the way we're taught in first year, you know, all this flexion, extension, side bending. No one ever felt anything anyway. Uh, not really. We all lied in those exams and hoped we weren't shaped because we couldn't really feel anything. It was never reproducible. No two food, two people felt the same thing, and neither did the examiner. And the examiner was complicit in it, and they just say, "Yeah, very good." Or if they were feeling me, no, I don't feel that, and it's agree, it's agree with you. But you know, there's no validity, and we know those tests are invalid. They don't work. Um, but actually, what's interesting is that we've done some small scale studies when I was in clinic, and we and one of my students did a, a super, he, he used this model of density testing, we have far more agreement amongst that, because it's actually what practitioners do very quickly. You know, you've all had the experience when you're a, uh, when you're a student and you spend half an hour examining a patient, the tutor would come in and two minutes later, they go, oh yeah, this is where they're probably you know, what do they do? And they can't even tell you what they did. They just, they will say, oh, well, I did the same as you, but they didn't. They're feeling for density. They, they're doing it subconsciously. Even if they're not consciously doing it, that's what they are doing. They feel it very quickly and they get good at doing that. And, 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 uh, and I suppose it just took me a while to realise, oh, that's what we're all doing, but we just don't talk about it because it's not what we were taught, so we can't teach it because no one can teach something that is departing from what we were all taught. We all say, well, we've all got to take the same route, but we actually lie because we're, we're, we're perpetuating something that didn't work for us. We figure out something else, don't give a name to it, but we feel it, and, but I can't possibly teach it because, well, it's not in the curriculum. Um, so I don't know what the answer is. The Americans do this much more, and they have a much better vocabulary around it, and they, they actually teach what they do, you know, how they, exam how they examine, and it, and, it, and it really works, and you, and you can feel this hardness. That we, there is a degree of agreement, because often there'll be pain associated, and there's quite good localization, and then it's how we interpret that, and there is a way of taking those areas of density and turning that into a diagnosis, and then seeing whether it's changed afterwards. And when it does, it's amazing, because you can say to your patient with a degree of confidence, you're going to feel better now. And it's great. They feel great, because you feel confident, and you know that there's been change. And I wish I'd been taught it as a student, but no one, we just didn't do it. I had to figure it out. So, so it, and, and, and if you pick up this change in density, you can compare a cranial restriction to a visceral restriction to a lumbar or a sacral restriction and decide which one is harder. Even though they're different structures, it's the quality of the pushback, the quality of the density, the quality of the um, reaction to your test is what's key. Uh, so it's not, obviously a head is going to feel harder than an abdomen, but it's more how do the tissues react, and if they're more reactive, then there's more dysfunction there, or they're harder, yeah, does that make sense? So that's what I want us to practice doing. You can all do it, I guarantee, uh, but it's just trusting your hand.